Good evening all. Welcome to Calvary and Wednesday night service. We will uh, have some prayer time and some reading time and some discussion time like we normally do. Uh, Paul and Darlene made it back from Missouri, so welcome back after a long drive home. Got home about an hour ago and made it for Wednesday night. And so, um, appreciate them being here. Appreciate Paul leading out Sunday morning as well. And so, I got good reports. He behaved himself. Darlene, Dar <laughs> hmm. uh, it was good service. So I, I got I got two services this week. We went with Hannah to one of the church she's been attending at Cedarville, and then on Monday I went to Calvary. So it was good. And I really I, I really liked. And I, I've said this to several people the the ten step illustration that Paul used of of judging, and I I threw that on our website uh, after I watched the, the sermon and um, I've had that conversation with several people this week about if we would just apply these things what a different world we would live in how our conversations would be different uh, if we just do those things in fact I, I don't think many of us would get past number two or number three before we had a change of mindset um, yeah uh, I'd have to look on Facebook <laughs> um so let me start us tonight uh, slightly different. I mean, in the same vein as what we normally do, but slightly different. Um, let's start with praise us. How's God blessed you? I don't spend enough time praising. Larry? Got him through a dentist appointment. Two fillings and a crown to work on. I'm still working on my crown, too, but mine don't come till heaven. <laughs> All right, so praise the Lord. Yep. <laughs> yeah so kids who wanted to work in the neighborhood just to, to help out and earn a little bit of money that's neat what a blessing yeah out. Yeah. That's neat. Good deal. Other blessings. Have you been blessed? Good trip. So Paul was and Darlene were doing senior adult ministry with a pastor friend of ours in uh, Missouri where he pastors now, Jeff Burns, his wife, Kathy. Um, and so good time, good times. Jeff was one of the guys that went to Ecuador with us. He was the one who was sick the entire week we were there. <laughs> yeah. Yep, good memories. Good. All right. Anybody else? Y'all slow on praises, Polly. Yeah. Praising the Lord for strength and energy to get through the day, get things done. Dan. All right. So an opportunity to share a Bible with a co-worker. Good deal. All right. We've got some. All 
Oh, good. So the Gideons will be given out. Yeah, Riley Festival this weekend, so uh, uh, y'all have fun. Um, but Gideons will be out with their Bible table, so that's a, a good opportunity for the Word of God to get out. Good. Got prayer, prayer requests for you, uh, several. Uh, Mary Hendren and Jean Polk and Penny, uh, their other sister. Um, their dad passed away this week, Buck Hendren. And uh, visitations tomorrow night from 4 to 8 at Stillinger Funeral Home. And service 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. Uh, following that, we'll have a meal for the family here at the church. I'm guessing probably around 11. Um, I emailed this out earlier today, so uh, if you get my emails, uh, you'll have this. If you don't and you want it, let me know. We'll get you added. You can do it through our website on the media page. You can uh, uh, scroll down, and it's got a place you can sign up for the uh, prayer uh, uh, reports that I do a couple times a week. Anyway, Angie Evans, it's Ken Lobb's uh, granddaughter. It's Mike's daughter, his his oldest boy, uh, he and Elsie's oldest. Um and she has an abnormal growth in her abdomen wall, and we'll have to have surgery. They're doing testing on it to see what it is, but eventually she'll have to have surgery on it. Got a call from Steve Manwaring this afternoon, um, and yesterday his nephew, who's 13 years old, his name's Cole, his mom asked him to back the car out of the driveway, and he ran over her. And they were worried. He called his dad and said, I killed mom. He didn't. She's still alive. Uh, but I guess she was critical last night, made it through to today, and they're prayerful that she will survive and heal. So uh, they're in Florida. But the 13-year-old's name is Cole, and Steve said just pray for his spirit that he'd be protected with guilt and all the things that go with that. So uh, appreciate prayers for his mom's healing, of course. His mom's name is Jennifer, but also for Cole um, and the family. Um Anthony Hancock posted on, on, I think it was on our Facebook page somewhere, that Becky has surgery coming up, and I don't remember the, do you remember when? I didn't, November? Okay, sometime in November, Becky will be having surgery on her back. They found out, or have figured out that her pain was not all the things they've been treating, but rather, um, I, I believe it was ruptured discs or something more serious in the back that they're going to have to, do a rod and surgery to repair. So uh, keep Becky in your prayers. She's had a had a difficult year or longer with this, and uh, uh, now she's facing surgery in November. Um, Etta Kirby uh, has shingles, and so we need to keep her in our prayers for healing. About three months. Okay, saw Bob Orr today. He is allowed to have visitors now. Uh, afternoons are usually a good time because he does physical therapy in the mornings. Uh, Shirley is there uh, morning, noon, and evening to, to bring him food. And uh, I saw him this afternoon. I had a great talk with him. He, he's, he wants to go home really badly, but his health does not allow for that. Uh, between his physical ailments, just, he's become weak over the, over the last years. Uh, he's on oxygen full time and stumbles over the cord. He's a fall hazard. And then, of course, the dementia as well. Uh, probably not going to ever be able to come back home and live. And so uh, he doesn't know that. He doesn't understand that. Um, but he really wants to. So if you go visit him, he's going to tell you he wants to go home. He can't wait to get home or come back to church. That's mostly what we talked about. So he couldn't wait to come back to church. Um, just love on him and encourage him. Don't make you any promises. <laughs> um, because he, he, he was very uh, engaging conversationally today. Had a, had a good visit with him. So uh, I'm not sure exactly when he opened up for visits, but uh, within, within sometime either last week or this week, I talked to Shirley the end of last week and asked her when he would start being able to have visits. And she said, anytime. And so you can, you can see him, room 44 at Golden Living. So that was a blessing today. All right. Others.
Yeah. 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 Okay, so prayers with the blood pressure will be straightened out. Okay. Fix it, Lord. I like that. Yep. Dan? So a friend, last name's Blanchett, uh, Evie. Uh, so she died of COVID today, and her son should die within hours. His name is Gene. Okay. So they're from Massachusetts, right? The church they were at previously. Beth? No, give me an update. Wilma Serber's brother. Yeah. Okay, so a brother had uh, open heart surgery, uh, cardiac patient, Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. He is improving. Um, she did send me a message Monday or Tuesday um, and said that she would be with him until he was feeling better and you know, doing well enough that they were comfortable leaving. So his name is Charles. And so remember Wilma and Jim as they're now giving care to Wilma's brother uh, in the hospital. So and for him as he heals. Okay. Any others? Yeah. Yeah. So Chris's mom, um, they're discussing and trying to make arrangements for her to leave Springhurst uh, to finish her rehab from home, which is actually Chris's sister's house in the short term. Um, and so I don't have a day to ask Chris yesterday about that. They don't know yet when. They, they were first talked about early in the week, and then they're talking into the week, which is now here. But they don't have a date for that to happen. Um, and I'm not sure what all steps they're waiting on to make all that happen. So um, just keep praying. She's doing good. She's in recovery. She's uh, able to have the family visit now on a regular basis. And so, um, but she's she's excited about getting out of the nursing home. Uh, he said mostly she's doing pretty good with the loss of her husband. Um, as expected, there are bad days or, or harder days, um, but she's doing pretty well overall. So keep her in your prayers. Yeah. So tell me her name again. Janice. Uh, diagnosed with with kidney cancer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other prayer needs? All righty. Well, let's pray together and uh, we'll get into the scripture. Father, we do thank you for our time together tonight. We thank you for these who have gathered here in person. Um, we just ask that you would bless them with health and with with uh, 
um, opportunity to, to learn uh, from you, from, from your word, uh, to be encouraged through our fellowship, and then to give, be given opportunity to share uh, their love for you with others as they go from this place tonight. Lord, I thank you for those who are with us online. Uh, we ask the same things for them, that wherever they may be, that they would be a light um, into the darkness, that they would be able to share Christ and their love for you with those around them. Father, speak to them, teach them, protect them, uh, uh, whatever it would be, whatever it is that they're, they're at home or at work or on vacation, whatever it is, just be with them where they are and use them wherever you have placed them. Father, we thank you for our loved ones and we let, lift them up to you for health. Lord, we know that you are able to do more than we can ask or imagine according to your glorious riches, but we also know that sometimes our will is not your will. So, Lord, we want to pray like Jesus with faith, saying, your will be done, not mine. Knowing and understanding that your will is far better than ours, even when it hurts, even when it doesn't make sense. So, Lord, help us to see with your eyes. Help us to hear with your ears. Help us to follow where you lead. May we see clearly the path that you have prepared for us each and every day. But we want to lift up those who don't know Jesus. There are so many in our lives, in our communities, and more often than not, we don't even see them. We don't recognize their need for Jesus. So, Lord, help us to do better. Help us to see more clearly, to listen, and to be willing to act with courage and conviction, with compassion, but also with truth. We thank you uh, that we are your children, your ambassadors, that we are empowered by your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, help us not to fear, but to have courage and to go forward being who you've called us to be. We thank you tonight that as we read your word, that we've been promised that through your Holy Spirit, we will have understanding. We ask for conviction um, to repent for any wrongs that we have committed or done, sin in our lives, to be restored. To have conviction to serve, and to minister, and to share. Father, to follow in obedience wherever you would lead. It's our desire to know you intimately, fully, completely. To make you known to those in our paths as we live it out. Lord, help us to be faithful in the small things. So we can be faithful in the large things. Speak to us tonight. May we hear from you. We ask this in Jesus name. All right. We are in Nehemiah chapter 9. Probably only going to have two more lessons in Nehemiah. We're quickly coming to the end. Um, unless you want to read a whole bunch of names. And I don't particularly want to read a whole bunch of names. Um, so we're quickly coming to the end, um, but we'll, we'll look at it this week, at least next week, maybe, maybe two more weeks, but, uh, we'll see how far we get. Um, last week we talked about the reading of the law, uh, publicly, the turning of hearts to the Lord, the embracing of celebrating the festival of booths or tents, um, uh, where they made their shelters on their rooftops. And they invited every, the whole community in. Uh, they listened to the, the reading of the law. They had great assemblies. Um, and, and just uh, uh, renewed themselves in a, in a way. Uh, out of this renewal. Out of this conviction. That we come to chapter 9. And we're going to see the, the result. Um, in the lives of the Israelites at this season. At this time. Uh, one of the things that I'll remind you. Is when you read through the Old Testament. You, you are in a, a cycle. Um, it's not necessarily a good cycle, but it is the cycle. You got people who uh, love Jesus or love the Lord or their God with all their heart, mind, and soul. They, they want to be right. They want to do the right things. They get excited. They get enthusiastic. They make uh, reforms and changes. And it's not long until they lose their enthusiasm. It's not long until they begin to embrace sin. It's not long until they have disregarded God. It's not long until they are punished by God. And then it's not long until they cry out, Oh Lord, we need you. 
And it's, sometimes the cycle's in days, sometimes it's in weeks, sometimes it's in months, sometimes it's in years. But that cycle is continual through the Old Testament. And I think if you look at your own life, it's probably continual today as well. Uh, right now, they're on the high side. They have recognized their distance from God. They've recognized their sinfulness. And out of that, we have chapter 9. So listen as I read. On the 24th day of this month, uh, we're in the seventh month, the month of, of, of sheltering, uh, where they're celebrating the, 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 the uh, um, festival. So on the 24th day of this month, the Israelites assembled. They were fasting, wearing sackcloth, and had put dust on their heads. Those from Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sin and their iniquity and the iniquities of their fathers. While they stood in their places, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day. And they spent another fourth of the day in confession and worship of the Lord their God. Several of the Levites stood and rate on the raised platform. And they cried out loudly to the Lord, their God. Then the Levites, you notice I'm skipping all the names, right? They're in there. I'm just skipping them. Said, stand up. Be blessed. Uh, blessed be the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name. And may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You, Lord, are the only God. You created the heavens and the highest heavens with all their stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and all the stars of heaven worship you. You, Lord, are the God who chose Abram and brought him out. of. Uh, actually, let me stop there. Verse 7. I'll, we'll pick back up in a minute uh, because he's going to start a rendition of the history of Israel. And uh, so I want to come to that. Before we get into that, as they bless the name of the Lord, one of the things they do is remember their past. And, and we're going to get to that. Uh, but out of this restoration, the, the, this recognizing of the need to be restored, after, after their days uh, of celebrating, they went into days of fasting and wearing sackcloth. Why do you fast and wear sackcloth? What's the purpose in that? You're, you're showing humility before the Lord. What else? Anything else? It, it, it shows a worthiness of heart that you're willing to sacrifice and, and you're recognizing God's provision. And Yeah. It, it, it's an outward um, show uh, of an inward um, seriousness of change. Now, the fasting is not as much to be seen because we're told to fast in private. Uh, but this was probably, a, in a sense, a national fasting that it was encouraged that they would all fast and um, and they had put dust on their heads Lord we recognize we're, we're separated from you we're as good as dead um, apart from you our sin has made us dead and it says they separate themselves out from all foreigners now we've talked about this a couple of times so it's been mentioned over the last few weeks um, there are times when in the restoration that the Israelites were called to, to leave foreign spouses that were ungodly and never should have been marriages that never should have had and those kind of things. A separating out uh, 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 for holiness. Um, here it says they separated themselves from all foreigners. Um, so they're, they're trying to set a, a symbolism or a sign of cleanliness, of willingness to follow God and God alone. To listen to all the things he's told them. To do it. Uh, completely to not have any distractions in in their in their faithfulness and what they do as they got super serious with God I'm just going to call all that stuff above super serious so as they got super serious with God what they do they 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 before they praised him they stood and they confessed their sin And their iniquity, and the iniquities of their fathers. And we talk about that a lot when we read scripture. We're not very good at doing that. Because usually when it comes to my sin, guess what I live on? Guess what, guess what, guess what biblical teaching I stand on when it comes to my sin? I can confess directly to the throne of God from my private place. 
But when it's your sin, guess what? Oh, it's public. You need to confess that before. Just stand up and confess it. Well, they were all confessing their sin. It was a public movement. They're confessing the sins of their fathers. And probably what they're recognizing is, we've not lived up to the law of God, because that's what they've been listening to be read. And quite frankly, because we didn't know the law of God. And we're confessing it. It's public. It's here. We, these are the things we've done. We, we, we have worshipped false gods. We have made sacrifices. We have eaten the wrong foods. We have not uh, been kosher the way we're supposed to be kosher. Um, we have intermarried with people God said not to intermarry with. We've done this and we've done that. and They're naming them. And they're claiming them as sin that needs to be washed away. Needs to be forgiven. Um, they're lifting it up to him. They separated themselves out from the foreigners as they did this. This was the closest family. The safest place for them to be able to do this. And they confessed their sins and iniquities. And the, and the iniquities of their fathers. Guys, we've been way off base and we need to make this right. Sometimes we confess our sins too publicly. And we do harm to the name of God. And I'm not saying hide them. But I'm saying sometimes in doing it in the wrong setting, at the wrong time, in the wrong place. I think we can do harm. They're here with the family. They're here with the Israelites. They're confessing their sin. In a way in which they can begin to make changes, reforms, to do things right. Um, it says, while they stood in their places, what they do? They read from the book of the law. One of the things I don't think we do well, I know I don't do it well. I, I'm quick to confess sin. I'm not quick to replace sin. Why do smokers smoke? What are they addicted to? There have been studies done, and you're all smarter than me, and you're going to go look this up, and you're going to tell me I'm wrong. There have been studies done that show that, that the addiction to the social act of smoking is actually a stronger addiction than the addiction to nicotine. Why do alcoholics drink? Not always, and I, I do, I'm not trying to say that, that nicotine addiction is not a real thing. It is. I'm not saying alcoholism is not a real thing. It is. But they're with their buddies. They're with what they've created as a family unit. It's a place to go and spend time. And they're not alone. And they're accepted. They do these things. When we confess sin. And we're in a habit of sin. If we don't replace it with something holy. What's going to happen? Another way to look at this. Another way to say it. The guy who cleaned out his house. Kicked the demon out. Cleaned out his house. What happened? Came back with seven more. Why? Because the house wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. It's why that why the, the, the scripture says. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Is so important. We got to get rid of the filth. But getting rid of the filth isn't enough. If you don't replace that hole with something positive. What's going to happen? It's going to return. Or something worse is going to return. What they do? They confessed their sins and the iniquities of their father. And they went to the law of God. They read the word of God. And they replaced in their hearts that which was evil with those things that were good. This started when they, Ezra began to read at the beginning of chapter 8. And they recognized the festival. And they began to celebrate and cry and weep. Because they, they knew they were in a wrong place. And they were hearing the right place they needed to be. And they were excited about being reconnected with the God of their fathers. That's why what's going to happen in the next section we're going to look at. When they recount the history of Israel is important. These are the, This is the God of our fathers. This is our history. And we got away from it. We lost that which was important. And so as they confess their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. What do they do? They go back to the truth of God. 
And I think what we often forget to do as we confess sin is we forget to replace it with something holy. If your sin, and I'm not saying secular music is necessarily a sin. I don't want to paint with a broad brush here. But if, if God has convicted you of listening to secular, secular music, not drawing you as close to him as you need to be, and so you cut out the music, what do you do? Your heart still hungers for music, right? So what do you replace it with? If you don't replace it with something, you're going to end up right back where you started. Christian music, it's got a place, right? It's got that place to fill that gap in our heart where we're looking for the right thing to be there that will draw us closer to God. I think there's a truth here in chapter 9 as we look at this. They separated themselves out from the world. They went to the Lord together in the family unit. And then they went to the word of God to replace that which they were removing. Questions, thoughts? Yeah. Sure. That's good. Mm. Yeah. So, I, I like both of those, actually. So, let's start with the first one. Help me. What was it again? Revival. Yeah. So, so a, as they are um, confessing publicly, uh, Paul rightly uh, notates that revival can't start without public confession of sin. Because it's that repentance that, that begins to then touch somebody else and then touch somebody else and becomes a hotbed of change uh, in people's lives. And uh, all... all National or, or major revivals have, have come through that recognition of public confession of sin. Now, I think there's probably um, um, validity in, in that statement. Um, that that was a huge part of what spurred revivals on through, through our history. The second was maybe the reason they, they separated from, from the foreigners was... Because there is the, the Israeli or the Jewish national sin was not the foreigner's sin. So they were separating them out. They're not guilty of what we did because they're not part of this at this point. They could choose to be part of the positive, but we're not going to hold them guilty for our negative. Um, and, and so I think both of those good thoughts. Anybody else got thoughts so far? Is it Larry? Yeah. Yeah. So revival is bringing something back to life that's dead, and and uh, if we're not being re revived or living a revived life, then our witness is dead, and we need to keep it going, and we need to be active in our faith and when we recognize or realize that we're not where we need to be as an individual as a nation i think it's okay to say we have sinned we've separated ourselves we're not living biblically we we, we need to be more right um what i what we'll, we'll it, it talks in generalities here i'm sure there were a lot lot more um specifics being named as they went through it um but there's got to be a willingness to change. And I think that's what we see here. And what we're going to get into as we go forward. And we're going to fast forward through a lot of the, of the, of the next sections. We'll, we'll get enough of a glimpse, I think, to see the process that's taking place. But we got to replace that which we're confessing as wrong with the things of God. Yeah. We all need revival. First uh, John one nine is there to teach us that and to get, move us in that process. Um, so he starts in ver verse five there with with blessing, blessed be the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. He he goes on, blessed be your glorious name. 
So we're sinners, we're wrong, we read the law, we want to do right. And the priesthood here is, is who's calling this out. And they're leading the people back into the presence of God. Removing the guilt, but now adding the blessing or recognizing the blessing of God. Recognizing His character, His nature. Uh, blessed be your glorious name. Uh, holy, holy is His name. That may be exalted uh, above all blessing and praise. God's even higher than we can than we can recognize, than we can understand. He, he's, even, he's above our praises and our blessings. Uh, you, Lord... One and only God. Uh, you go back to the Shema. There is one God and one God alone. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Um, you created the heavens and the earth. So we're going to get into this narrative now of all that God has done. It starts here in verse 6. Uh, and it's going to recognize much of what he's done um, throughout the history uh, of the world. Um, you are the creator of the heavens. You created the, the highest heavens with all their stars. So you got the heaven where God lives. You got the highest heavens, where which is the atmosphere, the stars, the the galaxy, the earth, and everything that is in it, uh, the seas, and everything that's in them. It says you give life to all of them. Where does life come from? God. He breathed life into us. He created life in, in the animals and the plants and the, all the sea creatures. The stars of heaven worship you. Just a question, because in symbolism, the stars sometimes represent angels. Uh, the, fall, the fallen stars were the fallen angels. Um, a third of the stars fell out of heaven. Um, what did, you, th you think he's talking about the literal twinkle twinkles here? You think he's talking about angels? Just ask it. I don't actually have an answer here. I think he's talking about literal stars personally, but I don't really have an answer for you theologically. Got some symbolism going on, don't you? God's creation cries out his name. I mean, we look at the mountains, we look at the trees, we look at all, all the different parts of creation. We got natural revelation. That's what we call that. And it does uh, point us toward his glory, doesn't it? A God who can create the Grand Canyon, a God who can create um, just all the natural wonders. Pretty awesome stuff. The mountains, the majesty. Uh, all those things. Verse 7. You the Lord God are the one who chose Abram. So we're going to go now into the history of man. Or the history of, of the faith. The fathers of the faith. You brought him out of Ur. Changed his name to Abraham. Um, you found him faithful. You made a covenant. Uh, you, you passed the land uh, on down. I gave, him, gave him certain lands. You have fulfilled your promise. You are the righteous one. Verse 9. You saw the oppression. Of our ancestors in Egypt. We move over to Moses now. You performed your signs and wonders. Um, in front of all the officials. You made a name for yourself. At the end of verse 10. A name that endures to this day. Which is interesting. Because I'm telling the story of Moses right now. How long has the name of God. Dealing with Pharaoh lasted. Since the time it happened. Until today. Kind of interesting isn't it. You made a name for yourself. That endures to this day. It says, you divided the sea before them. They crossed it on dry ground. That was our story of the day. Uh, hurled their pursuers into the depths. Um, you led them uh, across the desert. You got your pillar of cloud. You got your, your, your uh, uh, fire at night. Um, came to Mount Sinai. You spoke to them. Gave them ordinances and instructions. I like, I actually, I like this end of verse, verse 13. You gave them impartial ordinances. That means they're for everybody. They're not a respecter of persons. Reliable instructions. I like, I like the way this verse read, or this translation reads. Uh, you didn't just tell us to do stuff. The stuff you told us to do is reliable. You always want good information, right? Um, and good statutes and commands. I kind of like that. I don't know how it reads in other versions because I didn't look it up. But I kind of like that. Um, Everything he's done has been good. From the people he's used to the things that he has said. You revealed your holy Sabbath to them. It's interesting in verse 14. That's what he pulls out. Of the Ten Commandments. This is the one he focuses on. Why? Maybe I should read a little bit further. Because he's going to talk a little bit more maybe about this. But 
Why do you think he pulls out the Sabbath? And why, why is the Sabbath so important? What's the purpose of the Sabbath? To rest, that's part of it, because the Lord rested on the seventh day. Six days you work, and on the seventh day you rest from your labors. What else do you do on the Sabbath besides take naps? Thinking more, meditating on what you should be doing. Throughout the history of Israel, what they do on the Sabbath? They worship the Lord. They went to church. They went to synagogue. They spent their day mentally, kind of like what you're saying, Jim, in the presence of the Lord. So when they're talking about the history of Israel, they're talking about the laws and ordinances and the things that God gave to them through Moses. Nehemiah, the writer of Nehemiah, pulls out the fact, they give the praise that, or these priests give the praise that, he gave us the Sabbath, a day to remember all that the Lord has done for us. Maybe a different way to think of what Sabbath is. That day of rest is a day for us to look back and to look forward over all the Lord has done for us. While you're at rest, be thankful, worship. Praise the Lord. It, a time for us to draw near to him. So a simple translation of Sabbath, and, and I realize, you, you all realize I'm super simple, right? So a simple translation of Sabbath is a holy day. Sabbath means holy day. In a holy week, guess what you have? You have more Sabbaths. Uh, it, it, guess what they just finished? A season, in a sense, of Sabbath. What do you have every 50 years? What? Jubilee. What is it called? It's a year of Sabbath, basically. Every seven years, you have the year of rest for the lands. Gonna, he's going to talk about that. Um, and so we have these things that happen. Over and over and over through scripture. That come back to this idea. Of resting in the Lord. It's interesting to me. That as he looks at the heroes of the faith. He doesn't, he doesn't bring out. All of the ten commandments. He focuses in on the Sabbath. The day we recognize who the Lord is. It may be important to recognize. It's fresh on their minds. Because they just came through a season. Of being separated from the word of God. To the reading of the law through from Ezra and being returned to the word of God. And now they realize the importance of Sabbath. Where they can study and, and, and meditate on and, and reflect on and rest in the presence of the Lord. They just finished a, a festival season of booths or, or, or tents where they set themselves apart for the purpose of recognizing um, the, the wandering in the wilderness. The recognizing... Uh, uh, their time where they were separated out, but God protected them and moved them into right relationship, into the Canaan land, the promised land, into, into, into the proper place. And so this whole idea of Sabbath, I think, should bring us to that place. And I think that's what they had in mind as they draw that out. Maybe I'm reading way too much into it. Uh, in verse 14, you revealed your holy Sabbath to them. You gave them commands and statutes and instructions through your servant Moses. You provided for them. You got bread. You got water miraculously. Um, so I, I was telling the story of the Red Sea this morning. And I, I'm like, um, there's a river. And it's deep and, and, and it's wide. And, and they don't have boats. And they, they can't get across it. And there's a whole bunch of them. And the army's coming to get them. And I said, what should they do? And one of the girls says, they should swim across. I said, well, they can't swim across. The river's too too hard to get across. They can't swim across it. And so they walked through on dry ground because God told Moses and she says, that was magic. And I said, no, that was a miracle. I said, miracle is something that only God can do. We need to remember that. I love when the kids get into the stories and that, you know, that little light bulb moment comes on for them. And she didn't have the right vocabulary to express what she was seeing, 
hopefully we gave her the right vocabulary and she'll retain that. Um, but that's what God did through Moses. Got him across the water, provided him uh, water from rocks, manna from heaven, um, took him into the new land to possess, for, into verse 15. Uh, but verse 16, the cycle, but our ancestors acted arrogantly. What is the arrogance of the ancestors? They stopped relying on God. In essence, what happened? They became a God unto themselves. We can do it without him. We think more of ourselves than we ought to. They became stiff-necked. What's that mean? Stubborn. They did not listen to your commands. They refused them. and did not remember your wonders. He goes on. There's, there's lots of stuff in here. I'm not going to read it all to you. Verse 20. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold manna from their mouths. Even though they didn't want to listen to you, you still loved them and did the right thing for them. You still got them to where you promised to take them. Verse 21, you provided for them in the wilderness for 40 years. They lacked nothing. He praises them. Clothes did not wear out. Their feet did not smell, uh, swell. They may have smelled, but they didn't swell. <laughs> no promise about how you smell, but you did not swell. Uh, verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and peoples and established boundaries for them. They took possession of the lands you promised them. Uh, you brought them to the land their ancestors possessed. You restored them to that land of Abraham. Um, handed their kings and surrounding peoples. Verse 25, you captured their fortified cities. Uh, verse 26, they were disobedient and rebelled against you. you ki uh, they, they killed your prophets. They committed blasphemies. Verse 27, I know I'm skipping a lot. You can read through all this later. Um, you handed them over to their enemies who oppressed them. In their time of distress, they cried out to you and you heard from heaven in your abundant compassion. Compassion, You gave them deliverers who rescued them. We're in the book of Judges now. Uh, for the power of their enemies. But as soon as they had relief, they again did evil. So you abandoned them. Cycle. You warned them uh, uh, to turn back to your law. And they acted arrogantly. Verse 29. They would not obey your commands. They sinned. They were stiff-necked. Verse 30. You are patient with them. You hearing these key words I'm trying to pull out? We do the wrong thing. God does the right thing. We do the wrong thing. God does the right thing. He loves us in spite of ourselves. There are times where there's punishment. There are times when, when the people are, are oppressed in different things. But he's always willing. He's always doing the right thing. He's always showing compassion. Sometimes, in verse 30, he says, You handed them over to the surrounding peoples. In your abundant compassion, you did not destroy them or abandon them. You are a gracious God. So now, verse 32. Our God, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God, who keeps his gracious covenant, do not view lightly all the hardships that have afflicted us, our kings and leaders, our priests and prophets, our ancestors and all your people, for the days of the Assyrian kings until today, you are righteous concerning all that has happened to us. Because you have acted faithfully while we have acted wickedly. I want to stop for just a moment. Because in this part of the prayer, God, we recognize all the history and all that you've done for us. Our rights, our wrongs, our returns, your compassion. He says, we know who you are, great, awe-inspiring God, covenant keeper. We know who we are. You are righteous concerning all that has happened to us. You think the people praying this, Nehemiah, are personally guilty of all the things of the land of Israel? They're not saying, except me. You catch that? God, I'm, I'm glad I'm not among those people. No, Nehemiah kept saying all the time, time he's building the wall, I'm one of you. We're in this together. I think one of the reasons we don't see national revival is because the holy ones don't want to be part of the ones who have to repent. We don't want to be 
bound up by the sins of those around us who aren't listening to us. When Israel fell, guess who fell with her? Prophets. Priests. And holy people. Right along with the arrogant and the disobedient. The sinful and the pagan. You, God, we need to recognize. I'm going to apply this to the United States right now. We need to recognize God is righteous concerning all that is happening to us. We've earned it. Because we have acted. Because he has acted faithfully while we have acted wickedly. Maybe not individually. But all we all have individual sins. So don't misunderstand me. I do still recognize that too. Um, what, what did Isaiah say? Woe is me. Man of sinful lips among a people. Who are sinful. Our kings, our leaders, our priests. Verse 34. And ancestors did not obey your law. Or listen to your commands and warnings you gave them. You know what's missing from all this text? Excuses. I don't hear a single excuse. I think that was one of the things when we do judgment. We don't make excuses. I believe that was one of the things he talked about. When we make apology, I, that, maybe that was a side issue I was reading on. Um, is we, when we make apologies, we don't make excuses. We say, I was wrong. I wasn't wrong because... I was just wrong. Very few people know how to make a proper apology. Very few people. It's almost always, but you just don't know how busy I was. You don't know how much other things were going on in my life. You don't know how sad I was that day or what had happened just before. You know, I mean, somebody ran over my dog and kicked my car or vice versa. Uh, and, and so it's not my fault I acted that way. But I recognize what I did was wrong. I just want you to know it wasn't my fault. I got sin nature. It wasn't my fault. That's not in here anywhere. What they say was. We sinned. And Lord you're righteous. And everything that's happened to us. We're not going to complain about. Because we deserve a lot worse. But here's what we will do. I'm running out of time, so i got to get to what we will do. When they were in their kingdom, with the abundant goodness that you gave them, and spacious and fertile you set before them, uh, um, you would not serve or, or turn from the wicked ways. Here we are today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors, so that we could enjoy its fruit and goodness. But here we are, slaves in it. Its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have set over us. We're guilty. Verse 38. In view of all this... Maybe I should save this till next week. <laughs> if, yeah, that, 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 I'm just going to read it. We'll, 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 we'll pick up next week starting in verse 38. Because I, I don't have time to teach it. In view of all of this, we are making a binding agreement in writing on a sealed document containing the names of our leaders, the Levites and the priests. And they're going to make a new covenant. A new promise to God. That they're going to live righteously. Why? Because we're sinners. But our God is a covenant God showing compassion. And he's willing to restore if we're willing to admit sin. Repent, which means to turn away. But if you're going to turn away, remember what they do after they confess their sin and they had their sackcloth and ashes. They went to the scripture. They read the law. They remembered their history. What they're going to commit to, and we'll get into it next week, is they're going to commit to replacing all that evil with all the commands of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And the people said, Amen. And Amen. We'll do it. We're in. And they come up with it. And they reconfess it to him. And that's what's going to, we'll talk about the specifics of it next week. Last thoughts. I know I fast forward through a lot of that. So you got homework if you want to catch up. I got four minutes, so. I, I remember reading that. What verse is that? 
Okay. Go back to around verse 9. Um, verse 3. Yeah. So while they stood in their places, I read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day. And they spent another fourth of the day in confession and worship of the Lord their God. Um, why a, a fourth of a day and a fourth of the day? I don't know. I have no idea. I think, I think, so together we got half a day there, right? So half, a, so um, the first fourth of the day, um, get back to it here. Um, they stood in their places. They read from the book of law for a fourth of the day. Y'all complain because I ask you to read the Bible in a year, which takes you about 20 minutes a day. They read the Bible for a fourth of the day. How much is a fourth of the day? You got 24 hours, divide by four, that's six hours, right? I'm, ask, I'm asking you for about 20 minutes. I don't know what the Lord's asking you for. That's just what I ask you for. Fourth of the day. Daybreak till noon. Yeah, in the Hebrew calendar, that would have been about six hours. Um, that's right. I didn't connect that. Um, I don't know why a fourth of the day. Uh, they broke it down. Uh, uh, they read the book of the law, and they spent another fourth of the day in confession. You know, after you after you read the book of the law for the fourth of the day, you're going to need some confession, aren't you? You need a lunch break? You, 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 you. No, that's right. They're fasting. And we're in sackcloth and ashes. So uh, you might need a potty break, though. Um, that, and you might need to wash your feet because you got stinky feet. Um <laughs> uh, I, Lori, I really don't know the answer to your question, but they, they read for a while. Here, here, here's what I'd, I would interpret just off the top of my head. They read for a while. It may have been. So if they went from six in the morning till noon, they went from noon till six in the evening. It, it could have been the second half of the day or second half of their time period was confession of sins and worship in the Lord and worship in the Lord should always come out of confessing our sins. Why? Because you're getting rid of the evil. What are you going to replace it with? Worship. Celebrating the Lord. Uh, I'm looking on the good things. And you've got to fill it with something. What are you going to fill it with? You've got to know it before you can confess it. These were probably biblically illiterate that are becoming biblically literate people. They are excited about studying the, the word of the Lord. They had teachers explain it to them. That's what we had in the previous chapter. I'm assuming that's still going on. That was the common practice. So, yeah. Yeah, was it six hours of straight reading? Well, actually, the people probably weren't reading at all. It was probably being read to them. But there were probably some teaching, explaining, discussion around it. The sabbatical, uh, not sabbatical, that's not the right word. Um, um, there, there, was, there was teaching taking place. I would, I would, I would assume. I don't know that. Um, but then, the, but then there's the confession, and there's the celebration. No, it would have been a scroll. There would have been a scroll rolled out, being held up, and somebody would have been reading it, uh, helping them to understand it. Yeah. No. So maybe some memorization taking place. Maybe if they had some foundation in it, it's a renewal of those truths. I don't know why a quarter day and quarter day. Maybe it has something to do with the festival and they can't eat till dark. Maybe it's, I don't I don't know they're fasting, so I don't I don't know. There's a lot more I don't know than I do know. I don't know. I think we should just change our worship service to fit their practices. <laughs> I'd rather be reading it than, than listening to it for six hours, quite frankly. All right. We're getting a little off track, but thank you. That was a good question. I just don't know the answer. But I think it does show that there's steps in what we do. We read the law or the word of God. We allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, and we worship him as we repent. So there is a progression that's there that's natural and, and right. But I don't know why the time periods. All right, anybody else? Paul? Yeah. So what we'll see next week as we get into, into chapter 10, 
Uh, I actually thought I'd get through more of that tonight, but um, I always think I'm going to get more than I do. Um, as we get into chapter 10, we're, that's exactly what we're going to see, is their level of seriousness in their reaffirmation to God is so much greater than what we typically do, would do today or expect from somebody today, where they not only covenanted, covenanted in their heart, they actually wrote it down to be reminded about it. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of lots of historical references where we see things like that at different time periods. So uh, where they're in agreement on a certain direction or behavior and, and they write it down. Uh, but there's also, we, could, we, we may have to bring this up next week too. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know, we don't swear to anything else. Um, God, our relationship with him ought to be enough. Uh, so what's the reason for writing it down? Well, they haven't had Jesus teach that yet. All right, lots of stuff to discuss on that next week. We'll probably do a lot of fast forwarding next week. We're gonna if we get into eleven and twelve, there's a lot of names, uh, genealogies, histories. So um, we'll, we'll we'll cover a lot of material in a short period of time next week. We may get all the way to the end. We may not, but we'll get close. We're getting there. I'm not trying to rush through it. We're just when we get to just a full chapter of names, uh, you don't want to hear me read them. And I don't want to read them. <laughs> All right, let me pray for you. We'll be dismissed. Father, we do love you. We thank you for our time together tonight. We thank you for your word of truth. And as we go from this place, help us to remember the lesson of history. You have loved your people and you have restored your people and you have made them useful in your kingdom. You have set them up for success. And every time that we have failed, you have been there to catch us and to give us another chance. So, Lord, tonight, remind us that if we will repent of our sins and confess Jesus as Lord, that you will save us. And not only will you save us, but that you will redeem us, that you will sanctify us, and that you will glorify us one day in heaven. Father, we thank you that in Christ Jesus, that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So, Lord, help us every day. To not make excuses, but rather to confess our sin and the sin of our nation, the sin of our church, the sin of our community. Say, woe is me, Lord. But also to say, I will do better by following you, by applying the things of your word, the truths, the commands, the ordinances. I will do as you have commanded me. And I will teach those around me to do the same. No excuses, Lord. Only a commitment to follow you to the best of my ability. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great night. We'll see you in the morning.